Hello everyone, welcome to today's episode of Let's Talk Footy featuring China High Park Football Club. I'm your host Shaheen and today I'm sitting down with three members within our club. Today we have Sophie who's a player in our women's league. She's also a parent of two of our soccer athletes within the club and she is also a former board member. We also have Fiona who was a player for a number of years and she has recently graduated to become a coach. And we also have Barbara, who is one of the newest coaches at the club. I hope you enjoy the show. So let's get started. Hello, ladies. Uh, welcome to the Let's Talk Footy podcast. It's my pleasure to have you all here. Thank you for your time on behalf of um, the club and myself for making the time uh, on a Saturday afternoon. It's beautiful outside. So I really appreciate your time and coming on. Um, so just... Um, one by one, I would like you to introduce yourselves um, with your name and your relation to the club and who you are, what brings you to the club, uh, and so that our audience can get to know you a little bit. So if you don't mind, we can start with Sophie. Sure. Um, so I'm Sophie Vero, and uh, I actually joined High Park, the Women's League, and I had to look this up, 2009. Definitely dating myself. Um, I think it was the one of the first years it happened, and uh, we played at BMO Field, um, uh, 7v7, and uh, I've been playing with the Women's League ever since. Um, and I became, I took over as the convener, I think around 2014, um, 16. So I've been the convener for the Women's League. And with that also was a board member for a few years. Um, and I have two daughters uh, that both, uh, one is in OPDL now, one's a U11. Um, so been with the club for a long time and both my kids started in Timbits at the club and are still with the club. So yeah, awesome. lifetime right here. Yes, a true fan, a true yeah. member of the, of the club. Uh, that's great. I have a few questions, which I will ask you later on. Uh, but let's, let's go ahead with, I guess, Fiona, uh, since she's, she's been at the club, I guess, longer than Barb, and then we'll get to Barb. Fiona, okay. Um, well, my name's Fiona Mulvihill. Um, I've been a player at the club for about six years. So since I think I joined when I was in grade seven, middle school, um, Last year was my last season with the club, sad, but um, now I'm a coach. I've been a coach for probably a little bit over a year, um, and I coach the U4 to U8 now. So, yeah. Nice. So that's our Active Start uh, program. So you work yeah. closely with Isla, I believe. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Uh, and Barbara, how about yourself? Uh, so hi, my name is Barb. I'm a grassroots coach and an OPDL assistant coach at the club. I just joined three months ago, so fairly new. A bit about me, I grew up in Ottawa, which is where I played most of my club soccer. I played for the West Ottawa Soccer Club, and then I went on to play for their League One team. And I ended up coming to Toronto for school. And that's sort of when I got into coaching as well, because a coach that had worked at the club I played for in Ottawa was now in Toronto and he knew I was here. So he reached out and asked if I'd be interested in any coaching positions. So I guess that's how my coaching career began. Awesome. And and you liked it, I guess. Yeah, I did. All right. You don't want Fiona to run away from coaching, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you. for Thank you all for sharing that. Um, I'm going to go back to Sophie and she mentioned she's been part of the club since 2009. Uh, that's a really long time, Sophie. And <laughs> um, what made you stick around? What made you to get, want to stay uh, and get more and more involved? What was the desire? Um, I think that I live in this neighborhood um, and always most have always lived here since I've been in Toronto. Uh, so I've always, I'm always the kind of person that when I become involved in something, especially when my kids started to be involved, I always am like, Oh, I want to be part of that and make it better. Um, so that was kind of how I started to get more more involved in, in with the women's league. The women's league was great, um, but there was a, an opportunity to the, the previous convener was leaving. Um, and I'm always kind of someone who looks at things and is like, okay, this is awesome, but how could we make it a little bit better? Um, and that was sort of one thing led to another. And then you became a board member. 
and then I did become a board member. At the time, uh, actually, they had a position. The board's been restructured, but the adult, if you were the adult convener, you, were, you automatically had a position on the board. There was like a representative who represented the adult leagues. Mm -hmm. um, so I was that person. Nice. And how did that experience, um, how was that experience for you? Did you, was it different? Being a board member? Yeah. How, um, did, it, you, how, did, it, how did it change your interaction with the club? Um, it made it a bit more complicated. It's always hard to be a parent and be a board member. I, ha I have to say, um, I also was on the board at the time the club was really transitioning. So I would say as you know, the last couple of years, especially things have like really become, I get the word is, I guess I would use as more professional. Um, and so I've been here since like, it was all parent coaches and, you know, they've slowly transitioned to, obviously we all have paid coaches, especially in the rep and even in the house league now. Um, so being a board member during that transition, it was hard, no doubt. Um, but also, you know, it's very rewarding now to see that the club continues to do really well. That's awesome. That's great to hear. Um, Fiona, um, so we heard about Sophie. How about yourself? Why, why did you decide uh, to become a coach? The reason why I'm asking is because I've mentioned this before. I'm a great, great fan of uh, players graduating, if you want to call it. Uh, to become coaches uh, just because I feel like they know they know what players are are like or feel like or they've been in their shoes so it's easier for them to understand or to have a connection so um, I want to know what your experience was as a player was uh, did you did something happen in your playing career that made you want to become a coach or was it instant and you just said you know I want to give it a try and see how it is what was your experience like well, it kind of started because I think I was in U17 and Isla, like she was a little bit new to the club and she was looking for female coaches. So she approached our team and basically said, you know, is there anyone here who wants to coach? She'd be with the little ones. It's not like difficult, I guess you could say, plus you're all players. So you could show them your moves, show them your skills and I was like, heck yes, I want to do that. I love working with kids. It's what I really am passionate about. Like I love, I love working with kids. It's my favorite thing in the whole world. Um, so when she said that, I was like, um, yes, please. So then I started working the summer of 2019, I think. Mm. And ever since then, I've been working for High Park, which is really fun. Um I don't know. There's nothing really in my experience as a player where I decided, oh, I want to be a coach. I never even thought that I would be a coach. Um, if Isla hadn't, you know, approached us, I probably would just have been a player and then nothing else. Like it wouldn't have transitioned at all. But it's been a really, really amazing experience. And I've had so much fun coaching and I'm really excited to start coaching the U7s and 8s this year. And um, cause they're a little bit older, so they understand a little bit more, which is always fun. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so is this something um, so far in your experience, is this something you would recommend to our other younger players that are you 14, 15, 16? Because I think one of the things that we want to start doing as a club is try to guide those younger players to, to start looking at coaching perhaps if they're interested. So is this something that you would recommend? Uh, yes, 100%. I think it would be a great opportunity for anyone. Um, you just have to, you know, know how to talk to kids and know how to kind of handle them a little bit. Active Start course is actually a really great course. It's really informative and it really helps you start working. And then once you build up a little bit of experience, it's, it's a breeze, I would say. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Thank you. And Coach Barb, how about you? Um, I have a question for you uh, because you've played at a high level and now you coach at a high level OPDL um, do you think let's say if you started um, being introduced to coaching earlier in your career do you think it would have made you a better player perhaps if if you were introduced to coaching do you think that adds to your knowledge as a player do you think it's beneficial maybe uh, yeah, I definitely agree that it would have made me a better player because I think as a coach, you have to see the game differently. As a player, you're always, you're basically just focused on playing. 
but as a coach there's so many different aspects that you have to focus on you have to focus on like what formation you're going to play how you're going to get your point across to the players and stuff like that whereas when you play you're not maybe like thinking about necessarily what formation you're playing you sort of just go on the field or like at least I felt like I was like this I would just go on the field and sort of do whatever because I loved being on the field and I didn't really think when I was on the field but I feel like I've learned so much as a coach and I feel like if I used what I learned as a coach in my playing days it would have made me a smarter player yeah well it's never too late right you can still you're still young you can still play um well you're, you're coming back from injury <laughs> but once you recovered speaking of that um one of the reasons why i wanted you to be on the show where i was keen was because um i know you had a serious injury when you were a player when you were younger um you had an acl injury if i'm not wrong uh and that's something that's uh i i would say common in in the female soccer players uh i wanted to ask you about it if you don't mind and and just for you to talk about your experience, how that affected your um, career, your your feelings, your your relationship with the game, and how did you overcome that injury? So I tore my ACL near the end of my season when I was 16. And I think it was one of the first major injuries I have experienced as a soccer player or as an athlete in general. And for those who don't know, ACL is a really long recovery process. So the full recovery range is anywhere from around like six months to 12 months, which is a long time. And it's also one of those things where you can't really just sit around and wait for it to get better. You have to put in a lot of work. So in that sense, it's really hard physically, but it's also really hard mentally. And I think before I sort of took the game for granted. It was something that was just always there. And then this is really the first time where I can do something that I loved. And uh, like I said, it was really hard mentally, but I think it uh, gave me a lot of perspective on what's important. And uh, I think it was really the first time where uh, like it was, it was a big setback for me, but uh, it really showed uh, me how much I have to work like if I want something how much I have to work for it to get back so I think I definitely could have handled it better in terms of uh, the mental aspect of the recovery I think I was uh, like really down about it for a long time uh, the physical aspect I I think I did that really well but it was definitely the mental aspect where now that I look back I definitely could have been better with that but I guess it's a learning experience. And sure. now I just had my meniscus done a month ago. And I think with that, like it is an easier surgery, but when I look at where I was mentally with when I tore my ACL versus when this injury happened, like it was a lot better because I had that experience from the first injury and yeah. I sort of knew what to expect and how to deal with it and like what helps with uh, dealing with it yeah for sure well I'm sorry that you've been injured again um, that's really unfortunate but unfortunately it's it's part of the game injuries are part of the game um, they happen uh, whether you can um, do things to prevent them as a player uh, that's a different discussion but I think um, no matter how much how much you take care of yourself uh, things can happen on the field that would lead to injuries and it's important for players to stay strong. Uh, I just recently had two players that, that were seriously injured um, right after we got back from, from the COVID break, if you want to call it. But it's, it's something that that's part of the game and players need to learn how to manage it, the mental aspect, the physical aspect, and then what they can do to maybe prevent it if it's possible. And you touched on the mental aspect of it. And Fiona, I know you wanted to speak about mental health and, and how, how the COVID anxiety, that's something you were passionate about and you wanted to discuss and talk about. Um, the stage is all yours. Um, okay, I don't even know where to begin. Um, I've had anxiety pretty much my entire life. I didn't know I had anxiety until I started playing soccer, which is kind of weird. Um, there's a little bit of a story to it. 
I'll try and shorten it as much as I can. Yeah. But basically what happened was I was having breathing problems. This was like my first year playing competitively. Um, breathing problems when I was playing like games and stuff. And it was weird. It would only happen sometimes. And my coach was like, at the time, he was like, you should go to the doctor and just get everything checked out to make sure you're okay. So I ended up going to the doctor and from the symptoms that I told them, they were like, uh, you have athletic induced asthma. So I was like, okay, they gave me a puffer and it wasn't working. And I was like, what is happening? And I went to a bunch of different doctors, got a bunch of different tests. And then like, they gave me so many different puffers, still wasn't working. And then in the end, I got a proper test done. And she basically said, you don't have asthma. I was like, what is wrong with me? I can't breathe. I don't know what's happening. So I ended up going to a therapist and basically told her everything that was going on. She asked me a bunch of stuff about, you know, my childhood and all this stuff. And she said, you know, you have anxiety. And I was like, what? But when she said it, it kind of made sense. Like all these things I was feeling, you know, I would. So it didn't even cross your mind up until that point. No, like I didn't even think about that. I was like, what? What even is this? Like I've heard people had anxiety, but I never thought I had it. Um, But it made total sense. I would always get very nervous and um, like right before practices, I would be like, oh, I'm so scared. I don't want to go. I'm scared that I'm not going to be good enough or things like that. And so after I was diagnosed, she basically said those breathing problems you were having were panic attacks. And I had panic attacks while I was playing. It was very scary. And it kept happening just a little bit after that. But my teammates and my coach were very, very supportive. Um, They really helped me through the entire time. I, you know, I still have anxiety, but I don't really have panic attacks anymore, which is great. Um, Yeah, I still go to therapy. I'm very open about that. I talk about that a lot with people because I think it's really good to educate people on mental health issues and you know it's okay if you need to talk to someone or if you need help with what you're dealing with um and I would say my like the biggest thing that helped me overcome you know a lot of my anxieties was my coach uh Dexter I don't know if anyone knew knows Dexter Dexter Gilmore um he was great he was such a mentor for me he just basically let me know you know it's okay you're having these panic attacks and I know, but it's not your fault. You are amazing. You're great. You're a great soccer player and it's not going to make you any less of a person. Like he just, he really helped me through it. My teammates were never um, judgmental about it. They, whenever I would have breathing issues, they'd be like, okay, if you know it's okay, let's just breathe for a second. Like we can do this. Let's get through it. Let's get through the game. And I eventually just stopped having them all together and, I think my game definitely was better after that. I was playing a lot more and I was playing um, longer periods of time through the game, which I should have been in the first place because, you know, I'm a defender. So usually play the most amount of time out of everyone. Um, But yeah, it was a huge struggle. And I just think that a lot of young players don't know what that feeling is that they're having. They might just think, oh, I'm really scared. I don't know what's happening but they could be having anxiety. And I think it's really important that players should tell their parents or tell their coach, you know, if you don't want to tell your parents, if you're too scared, that's why I think it's really important to have coaches, female coaches for female, for female players, because they might feel a little bit safer telling their coach might be like, Oh, well, she's like me. So maybe she's had the same thing or something like that. I just think it's really important to be supportive of all your players and, to have coaches that will be willing to talk to you about that. hundred percent, hundred percent. And um, I, I really appreciate you to uh, you coming and speaking about it. I think uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming one of the also ways that helped you to cope with it was being able to talk about it, share your feelings with, with your friends, your parents, your coaches. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's good for everybody that that could be players that are watching or, coaches or parents anybody that to to be educated to be aware of it so that if there is players that are going through it to be able to help them manage it 
Um, Sophie, when you listen um, to to Barb talk about her injury, uh, Fiona talk about anxiety and mental health, and your parent, your daughter plays OPDL. There's pressure there. There's, they, I'm sure there's players that might experience a bit, be a bit nervous. How do you feel about that? Th- does it make you look at things differently? Um, it, I mean, I think, well, in some ways, I think it's really great to hear both Fiona and Barb talk about their experiences because I can think, you know, about for my daughters to be able to hear them talk when we listen to the podcast, I think that's a like a huge thing because it's not very often that uh, they necessarily get to hear that. But I do think there's a shift in the world a little bit right now um, where people are talking more about it. And I think it's really like awesome, Fiona, that you're comfortable in talking um, openly about it. Cause I think it'll be really, really helpful for so many young girls. Um, obviously as a parent, you're always worried about your kids. I mean, one of the, one of the reasons I have my, you know, my kids are in soccer. I mean, they love soccer, but it's also just, a, you know, a help with, helps with confidence, um, helps with, you know, staying in good physical shape. The injury thing is very scary. My youngest daughter is, you know, the thought of, being injured is devastating to her. Um, and the older one now, even, you know, with OPDL, it's like, Oh my goodness, what if I get injured and I have to miss, um, you know, a practice or a whole bunch of time. Uh, so I think, you know, what Barb said about the mental side of it is a, is a really good thing to remind my kids of that, you know, it happens to, it can happen to everybody. So, um, mostly I just think it's really great that these conversations are being had openly. Um, and then I think it's kind of up to us as parents to make sure our kids have access to that so they can, they can hear those voices and hear voices of, you know, older women, younger women, um, who've gone through some of that. hundred percent completely agree with you. Uh, do you think it will also allow parents to maybe put themselves in the player's shoes or see things from the player's perspective. There's parents out there, it's getting better, 100%, but there is parents out there that the players feel the pressure already, you know, they want to perform. They don't, no player wants to not play well. They, they always want to do their best. They always want to impress their coaches, their teammates. But there is parents out there, there is coaches out there that are putting extra pressure negatively and, and negatively impacting the player's experience. Do you think uh, it's good, it's important for the parents to hear these things and understand that, you know, maybe if a, if their child is not having the greatest practice or, or they don't have a great game, it's okay. Maybe they are going through something. Maybe we have to be a bit more patient with them. Maybe uh, we need to do something about it. Maybe get them to speak. Do you think it's important for them to be a bit more understanding? Yeah, I do. Um, I can be completely honest and say that I, not that I've ever been a super crazy parent, but when my older daughter first started playing rep and there was games, I was definitely, uh, you know, verging into the not so good territory. And I actually started to see her face a few times when I would say something to her after a game. And I was like, that isn't, it's not okay the way I see her feeling. And um, I started to research it quite a bit. Um, And there's this great organization called I Love to Watch You Play. Uh, which I started to read all their blog posts and started to read tons of coaching stuff and do tons of research. And I was like, okay, I need to be a better sports parent. So I've actually come a long way. um, And I I now consider, I'm now probably a very annoying parent for the other parents on the sideline uh, (laughs) because I call parents out all the time. um, And I, especially with my younger daughter's group. And I have to say, you know, in my, in my years of my girls, both playing rap, some of the parent behavior I've seen is like absolutely appalling. And I, the hardest part for me is watching the kids, like the kids who have the parent on the sideline that, you know, they're turning their head to look at them every time they do something and the parent is shaking their head or what are you doing? And you just see the kids like truly their whole, their, their body just like crushes down. Um, so that, that, that's, it's not perfect. Um, I think at High Park, I, I think our coaches do a pretty good job of trying to manage some of that. Um, I know some of the parents aren't happy that they can't go in LCI, but I got to say, I think it's kind of awesome for the kids. And I think about those kids who even they spend their practices looking to the sideline and their parent is like right there constantly in their, in their ear. It's so great for those kids to not have that. So yeah. 
yeah, I, I still think it's a big problem, um, but you know, it, it is getting better. It is it's getting definitely, better. It's, it's getting better. Yeah. Uh, I, I am very hopeful. I think the more we talk about things, the more we educate each other, I think the, the better it's going to get. Um, even as a coach, like I have, I, I li- literally have footage of my first one or two games as a Halsey coach. Um, and, and I've looked at them and it's, it's like day and night. Um, the, the amount of information I'm screaming from the sideline just because I was so young and I was so immature as a coach and I was just a player at that time still and I was just yelling random information that no player was taking in. Um, so just looking back at that, it's, it's through experience, through different experiences that you realize, okay, um, you need to look at things a bit differently. Um, Fiona and Barb, what do you think? Do you think as a player... Did the parents' um, parent behavior ever affect your performances? The way you felt, the way you played, the Barb. Um, I don't know. My mom didn't really like soccer, so <laughs> especially as I got like when I was younger, she'd go to a lot of my games. But as I got older, she sort of stopped going to my games. And my dad was always pretty quiet. Like I think in the ca- the car ride home, he would always try to give me some points. But other than that, Interesting he wasn't, yeah, he wasn't really the one to yell on the side. So I think I was really lucky in that sense. But I did have teammates whose parents were constantly like trying to coach them from the side. And I know they were, they would complain about it a lot. And it's not exactly like a comfortable thing as a player, because you're trying to listen to your coach, you're trying to listen to your teammates. And then you also have parents on the sideline. But I think even especially as you get older, you sort of learn to tune out the distractions. So I think maybe when I was younger, it might have bothered me a little more, especially like hearing other parents yell, like shoot the ball and stuff like that. But I feel like as I got older, you you learn to ignore the distractions and just focus on what you have to do. Yeah. What about you, Fiona? Um, I feel like my parents are great. They don't really, um, you know, yell at me being like, do this, do that. They're like, yay, Fiona, go Fiona. Um, And I would say High Park, like as a club, I'd say the parents are pretty awesome. I agree. Um, Especially like I've seen with like rep players and parents they're great it's a lot of just cheering encouragement you know everyone's all the parents are encouraging all the kids it's not they're not like pointing out their own kid which I always loved but there's definitely been some instances where we've been playing a team and the parents on the other team are just it's not good it doesn't go well like and I've seen players on other teams just yell at their parents because they're so annoyed with how their parent is treating them and how they're like trying to tell them every single little thing to do. And it sucked. I've seen girls cry because of it. And it, oh, it, I really hated it. We call them PlayStation parents. There's coaches, there's coaches. Yeah, no, like High Park is great. And if a parent ever was trying to do that, I feel like a lot of the coaches would just be like, leave or be quiet because They don't want to tolerate any kind of stuff like that. And I also have kind of like a different perspective on it from like as an act to start coach. There are definitely a lot of kids who want to just be with their parent the whole time and listen to everything their parent is telling them. But sometimes it's not the right thing, I would say. You know, they're trying to tell them to shoot the ball here and kick the ball away and do all this stuff. But we're trying to teach them little kicks, little dribbles, you know, don't kick the ball in the net until you're a few feet away from it, stuff like that. And they definitely like just run to their parents and listen to their parents. So now that we're in LCI and there's no parents, Mm -hmm. it's, it's a better coaching experience altogether. (laughs) Yeah. Um, to be to be really honest, um, I've been at the club for over a year now, and High Park truly, and I don't mean this, I don't, I don't say this because I'm here now, but I, it's one of the best parents group that I've experienced. Um, I have coached in different locations before, um, and I, I, 
I have I have personally never experienced any issues uh, with my players or my parents, uh, but I've also haven't really seen any parents um, behave inappropriately. So I'm very happy, and I think uh, it's it's a lot because of our culture, the culture that we're creating here, um, the community that we have. Everybody is um, understanding, and we've done a good job. Everybody, coaches, players, parents. So I think that deserves a lot of credit. Um, another thing that I want to touch on, um, and Barb, you mentioned this, um, you played double A hockey as well as soccer uh, at a high level. Um, what was your experience like playing two different sports until the age of 14, 15? Uh, so I was really lucky. The soccer club I played for was really supportive of me playing both sports. I also had one other teammate who played hockey with me and soccer with me. And I think it's so important, especially at younger ages, to play multiple sports. Because I think Why is a lot it? Of, um, I think a lot of the the stuff that I learned, like hockey's different movements compared to soccer. So you really learn different movements from an early age. And it's also, it's nice to have a bit of a change sometimes. Like as much as I loved soccer, if like maybe stuff wasn't going well, it was always nice to have hockey. And like if stuff was going better there, then I think it helped with my confidence. But I think it also comes, it mostly comes down to like building the good physical literacy and just like fundamental movement skills. Like soccer is great, but I think it's also really good to have um, experience with different sports, different movements, because in the end, uh, you can take what you learn from that sport and use it into soccer. And I have a strong belief that um, being a hockey player as well as a soccer player, it really helped me in my soccer. Uh, I guess one example of that would be aggressiveness. Like hockey is a really aggressive sport. And I think I would, as a player in soccer, I was really aggressive as well, but I didn't start being aggressive until I played hockey. So I think like that's one example of how playing hockey had helped me uh, in soccer, but it also gets to the point where it gets a little too much, especially playing two sports at high levels. Uh, I was missing a lot of winter soccer training for hockey. And then I ended up sitting on the bench a lot in the spring soccer season, especially, which was like, I understood why, because I wasn't there the whole winter, but I really wanted to be playing. So it gets to the point where like, especially for me, it was just too much to handle both sports. And I had to make the decision of what I wanted to do more. And, uh, it was a pretty easy decision. I think I always leaned towards soccer more, but in another sense, it was also hard because I also really like playing hockey. But yeah, I ended up, uh, I think I was 15 when I ended up uh, quitting hockey and just focusing on soccer. Nice, nice. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Um, I think playing multiple sports at young ages, it's very important. No kid should make a decision at the age of 9, 10, 11, 12 to pick a sport. I think we should allow them to play um, two, three different sports um, and, and because it's only beneficial for them. Uh, Sophie, do you, any of your daughters play other sports than soccer or are they soccer, soccer fans? No, like, well, it's interesting because as you, as you say that, I, I think to myself as a parent, it's becoming harder and harder to get your to to be able to get your kids to play multiple sports because I think that, you know, the sort of professionalization of youth sports, even my, my daughter who's starting as a U11, you know, it's like, oh, well, she trains two times a week. And then if there's games, that'll be a third time. And then there's pre OPDL. And so I agree with what you're saying. Like, I agree absolutely with what Barbara's saying and both of you, how important multiple sports are, but and I, you know, and the, and a lot of places say that, but then they are expecting kids to be there three, four times a week. And as a parent, you get caught up in the like, oh my God, is my kid going to get left behind? And no matter how much you read about kids' soccer develop or just development in general, you're still like that niggling, that sound at the back of your head. That's like, oh my God, well, what if they don't do that? So 
we have, I haven't done as good a job with my older daughter in that regard. Um, my younger daughter also plays hockey. Uh, she plays house league hockey. She started that a couple of years ago. Um, I worry a bit about, I do worry with the five, like four or five days a week, OPDL, just like overuse injuries, that kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, it, there's only two other days in the week. So it's, it's hard. Um, I, I think we still push kids to specialize a little bit too early. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. It's the, I, again, I hear you. And I think it's the reason why I asked you is because I want us to hear the parents' perspective. Um, I, I sometimes think to myself, p- parents, like some parents have more than one kid and the kids are playing more than one sport. Uh, the amount of traveling, the amount of time this, this takes is it's crazy. Uh, how parents do it, I have no idea. Uh, it's really, really fascinating to me. So I appreciate all the work that all the parents are doing, uh, coming to a 7.30 a.m. practice and then driving to another practice, picking up the other kid while after they drop off that kid. So it's it's not easy at all. Um, in terms of OPDL commitment that you mentioned, um, I had I have players uh, that play double-A hockey and are playing OPDL. Um, in the winter, I am personally more um, easy. Uh, I, it's okay for them to miss one practice of OPDL um, because they're playing, they're, they're, they're developing other skills uh, at, at hockey. So uh, I think it depends on the coaches they have. It depends on the player's interest, what kind of player they are personally. Um, but I think if he, if, he, if he can manage it and make it work, I think it could be very beneficial for the players. That's my, but of course, um, financially, time-wise, it's, it's not easy. So there's all the other things that, that we need to also consider. Uh, Fiona, is there anything that you want to talk with respect to multiple sports? Um, um, well, I just like to say I never played any other sport besides soccer. <laughs> um, I don't know why. I, I probably was like, I don't want to play anything else. My brother did play soccer and hockey. Um, he only played hockey for like a couple of years, I think. Um, and then he was like, soccer, soccer, soccer. And we both of us playing soccer at the same time was definitely a lot. It was, you know, and it, for b- different clubs also. So it was trying to figure out who has practice at what times, who has games here and there. It was a lot. Um, I definitely like saw because a couple of people on my team did play hockey or they skied, you know, they had a winter sport. Um, and our coach was a little bit, you know, he wanted them to pick, basically. And after a certain amount of time, they decided just to play soccer because it's what they liked more. And they were just in like a house league, hockey league kind of thing. So, I mean, yay, soccer for us. <laughs> and because our commitment level definitely went down in the winter seasons because there was people, you know, doing other things so my coach would got annoyed basically yeah. at that point so they just pick soccer and then we were like okay full team <laughs> yeah it's it's not fun when you prepare a session plan for 18 players and then you end up with nine you have to completely change it up um but it's good it makes us better coaches so that's okay too um i want to slowly start wrapping it up but before that i wanted to um just ask each and every single one of you i want to test your soccer knowledge <laughs> uh, uh, don't get nervous um i just want to i just want people to hear um what your favorite team is favorite player coach uh, i know sophie's a spurs fan um she told me to watch the documentary i did <laughs> it was great i don't regret it uh, at all so yeah, Sophie. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so Tottenham Hotspur supporter. Obviously, my uh, my little claim to fame is that my great grandfather played with for them for a couple of years. So oh really? When we ha- when we had to pick, and I'd actually completely forgotten. And when when our family was trying to pick who we were going to support in the Premier League a few years ago, uh, my cousin mentioned that, and we were like, oh, obviously that's that's uh, that's who we're choosing. Um, in terms of coaches. You know, I got to say I'm a pretty big Pochettino fan just because of his time at Spurs and he's a very likable guy. Um, 
and player wise, I don't really have a, you know, on the, on the men's side, I don't really have a player. I have to, it doesn't yeah, have no, I, no, it, it, like I, I have to say Christine Sinclair just because, you know, it's kind of cliche, but she's, she's awesome. And she's represented Canada well. And I just like, you know, who she is as a leader and a leader on the women's team and stuff. Of course. Of course. Uh, how about you, Barb? Uh, so you mentioned I, you don't watch a lot of sun. I'm joking. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I personally prefer to watch women's soccer over men's soccer. And if I had to pick a favorite team, I think I'd have to say, this might be an unpopular opinion, but I think I'd have to say it would be the U.S. women's national team. Just because I like their playing style. Yeah. Like, they're so <laughs> aggressive. And like, they're, they're just complete players. Like, they're so technically good, so fast. And I really enjoy watching their games. And in terms of favorite players, it would probably have to be Alex Morgan. But I also really oh my like god, Barbie, you're, you're digging <laughs> yourself into <laughs> there you go. really like Christine Sinclair. So, but Alex Morgan. Well, to be fair, Alex Morgan has just signed for Spurs. So yeah, her real... stock has gone up at our house. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let that one slide. Um, all right. Do you have a favorite coach? Not really, but um, maybe, can it be like someone that coached me? Of course it could. Okay, yeah. so uh, I was really lucky that at uh, West Ottawa, we had a female technical director, and she was also a former Canadian women's national team player. What was her name? Let's give her a shout her out. Her name's Christina Kiss. Okay. And uh, she... I was lucky enough to have her as my coach in U15 and she also coached the league one team and she was probably the best coach that I've ever had. So I would say she's my favorite coach. So what made her the best coach? What, Um, What do you remember about her the most? What, what made her be your favorite? She wasn't necessarily like the loudest person. She's actually pretty quiet, but whenever she talks, you know, that, what she's saying is really important and you like everybody listens to her and she also has so much she has so much experience playing but she also has a lot of knowledge so I definitely think when she coached me it was probably like the best soccer I have ever played just because her like the way she coached fit with how I played the game as well and she always she puts you in positions to succeed so obviously it comes down to your own work ethic and how much work you put in yourself. But I do also believe that the coach can uh, give you the tools to be successful. And I feel like she was really good at that. And even like with my team, just putting everybody into a position where they would have success and what would be the best for the team. So and I also, I really liked that she wasn't the type to yell a lot, but you knew that when she did yell or when she did talk, you had to listen. It's serious, yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you for that. That's great. And Fiona? Um, okay. I don't really watch a lot of soccer. I'm going to be honest. It's okay. It's not really my thing, which is weird. I, I do watch women's soccer when it's happening, I promise. Um, if you were to ask me my favorite team and my favorite player when I was like 10 years old, I would have said Arsenal and Christine St. Clair. I loved Christine St. Clair so much. Um, now my favorite player, she's on the Canadian national team. Her name's Jordan Hatima. I think that's how you pronounce her last name. Love her so much. She's 19 years old and she's phenomenal. She plays for Paris now. Um, she's definitely like I love her. Like, I was like, I want to be just like her, even though we're only a couple years in age <laughs> difference. Um, I don't really have a favorite team, which is bad, but I'll just say Canadians, Canadian women's national team. That's a good yeah. one. Um, my favorite coach, I'm going to say Elkin, because if he watches this and I don't say Elkin, he'll come for me. <laughs> um, no, but definitely he, I love Elkin. He has known me since I started the club, basically. He, he was new to the club when I was in, like, my first year at the club. So we've definitely grown together. Um, yeah, he's – I love him. He's great. What, what makes him a great coach? 
Let's oh. boost him up a bit. Let's boost him? Okay. No, um, I'm joking. Let's be honest. I don't know. There's just, he's just, he's a fun person to be around. And he's just, he knows a lot about soccer and he's really passionate about soccer, which is why he was just always great. And he's really fun to just like joke around with, but like he can be serious if he wants to. And, you know, like when he would come and play in our scrimmages, it was always a blast because he, no one could beat him ever. Um, he would just like do his little moves and be like, Elkin, go. <laughs> but yeah, no, he was just, he was really amazing. Created a fun environment. Oh, yes. Yeah. 100%. Really That's awesome. That's what coaches should do. They should make the players enjoy the experience and have fun. That's the most important thing. So shout out to Elkin. He's been on the podcast a few times. So now he's going to want to be on the show again. <laughs> um that's about it uh before we wrap up is there anything that i forgot to mention that you guys want to talk about this is your chance is there something that you want to mention that you think it's important for us to get out there um please please do so you asked me like earlier if i could talk a bit about the differences between maybe the clubs i've been at before versus high park for sure yes please so i think like that might be because sophie sort of touched on it in the beginning uh, okay, she said that ahead. Park's like really professional mm -hmm. and I think that's what I've noticed coming here is that they really work hard to create a professional environment for the staff but the players as well and okay. I think uh, especially as a coach there's this sense of community between the coaches in a way like everybody's connected and I already know so many people here and I've been here for three months whereas I had a really good experience at my other club, but I was close with maybe two or three people. And here I already know so many more people in my short time. And there's also one other important point. I think that High Park's trying to do a good job of uh, including more females in coaching positions. Like there's already a decent amount of female coaches within the club. And I'm personally lucky to work uh, closely with two other female coaches and it's great to have their support, especially because they have a lot of experience and I can learn a lot from them. And that's not something you get at every club. Thank so you. That's what I wanted to add. Thank but. you, Bar. Appreciate it. Uh, there definitely is a sense of community. That's that's one. Uh, that's our basically our vision: a community united through soccer. Um, so that's. I'm glad that you bring that up. I'm glad that you feel like that. You are one of the newest coaches at the club. Uh, welcome and uh, and I'm and I'm sure you're gonna have a great experience here you're gonna grow as a coach and enjoy your time and yeah thanks for bringing that up really appreciate it uh, that's that's it that's about it from me uh, again I want to thank you for making the time to be here I don't want to take too much of your time on the Saturday I know it's great outside we all want to go and experience a little bit of the sun before it goes down uh, so thank you, um, and I, I really hope that we can do this again, and maybe we can have you once again on the podcast in the future. So thank you so much. Thanks, Shaheen. Thank no you. Problem. My thank pleasure. You, Shaheen. So that's it for today. Hope you enjoyed the show. Please give us a thumbs up, share, subscribe, like, and I will see you next time. Take care.